Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to be talking about the protests in the United States, especially the response and the role of the police. Now, the police is very, very heavily militarized in the US, and we've seen a lot of images of these militarized police beating up people, arresting people, uh, perpetrating all kinds of atrocities. And often people wonder how the police, which is supposed to be a civil force, is actually so militarized. So, to talk more about this, we have with us Prabir Purkaisa. Thank you, Prabir, so much for joining us. And uh, could we first start by talking about maybe a bit of the history of how the police in the United States came to be so militarized? Well, you know, that's a long history. But before we get into that history, I think it's also important to see what the origins of the police have been in the United States, and particularly the southern of the southern United States, which was, as you remember, was basically where we had slavery and other things. So what it started was really the, uh, what are called the slave patrols, which went into, uh, you know, different areas at night looking for runaway slaves. And this is really the origin of the Southern police. In Northern police, it might have probably started as a volunteer force for local areas. So they were really a different origin, which we don't today understand. And of course, it was directed against the, essentially the black community, first as slaves, and even when they were freed, even after that, to deny them vote, imposing segregation, other things. So part of what you see is the militarization of police, which you didn't have really of this order before the 60s, is also the role of the police, one part of the role of the police in the United States has always been to impose segregationist policies, if you will, different kinds of rules and laws for different population sections. And finally, when the civil rights movement takes on a lot of this, and you do get desegregation, then uh, it transforms itself in a different way with war on drugs, war on crimes. All of these were coded in the United States as essentially war against a certain community. So police has always been a force which keeps down the black population, population and protects the white population is also what is in fact one of the major roles of the police. And if you see that, then you see the militarization of police which takes place. And as you said, the pictures are so striking that if you see the any uh, conflict between the protesters and the police, and you wonder, I mean, why are the police in combat gear? Why are they really looking like as if they have come from out of space in all kinds of you know, body armor? and uh, quite often including armored vehicles. In fact, if you can go down the list, you will see that a huge number of armored vehicles the police in the United States have uh, got. And some of them are heavy vehicles, not meant really for the roads or the, of the cities. So all of this is a curious issue. Why would the police be so militarized in a place where you don't really require at least uh, mine resistant armored vehicles. Now, why would you have that even that? And apparently there's 600 of them with the US poli different police uh, units. Now, coming back to the question you asked, why does it happen? It's interesting. It starts with what is called the SWAT teams. And these, of course, have been popularized by Hollywood, by television. Right. The SWAT teams really are supposed to respond to hostage situations when there is a hostage, there are barricades. That's when you are need, supposed to need SWAT teams. But they have been widely used for searches, search warrants, in situations which certainly are not hostage or there is no possibility of an armed conflict. And the number of SWAT teams as well as SWAT actions have gone up from 1960s, have gone up astronomically. So what is the 60s issue? 60s issue was really civil rights that once the civil rights are beaten back, then you get this kind of action start, which is to beat back again, the same population, which dares to protest. And of course, it was against uh, different sections of the black community, also against Black Panthers, which that's what the SWAT teams were used for initially. Right. But a lot of this militarization that you see gets accelerated in the 90s. And it's again interesting, it starts from Defense Department giving them 
cheap equipment or giving donating equipment which are supposedly surplus and about 5 billion of uh, worth of such equipment has been given to the United States. And after 9-11, uh, you also had a huge amount of money coming in from Homeland Security. Right. And of course, buying militarized equipment to the extent then that if you look at any of the pictures, whether it's Baghdad, if it's Kabul, or it is a city or a town in the United States, the police or the military all look the same. There doesn't really seem to be any difference. Yeah. And what it has done is it's the underlying issue of how to keep one section of population quote, under, quote, unquote, under control and protect the other section is the way the police also has actually configured itself, irrespective of whatever promises have been made at different points of time. So if the black community or the African American community has made gains, say, the slavery being abolished in, in the US South, then you got segregation and lynch laws. That's what happens. If you got the defeat of segregation, which is what happened in the civil rights movement, then of course you get what is called the war on drugs, the war on crime, and a whole set of uh, policing ideology, which essentially says the police is there to protect the white community, essentially keep the law. It is not a peacekeeping force. Yeah. It is to see that the law is enforced and you get what is called warrior training, that you go out there every day, you have to be a hair trigger alert because they're going to come and kill you. So you need to be prepared and you have to be on hair trigger alert. But you know, one of the issues that have come up by the police of using violence against protesters now, but also against various actions in which they have been caught, caught on camera. There have been so many other instances which have been there, has always been, well, you know, we are policing under difficult times. And therefore, you know, we are on hair trigger alert because you can be killed anytime. Therefore, we sometimes can overreact. We have to be excused for some of these things. But here was a very sharp picture in front of us that for nine minutes, you had pinned a guy who was handcuffed on the ground. You have other police officers really sitting on him. And you were you're putting on knee on his neck to so-called restrain him. And the man is not struggling. And if you see the picture of uh, the police officer concerned, he has his hand in his pocket. So he's certainly not, you know, under any pressure to leading this kind of action. So what you get is a continuous set of attitudes built into the police. And that is a part of the larger militarization that we see, which is really an extension of the race war that has always been there in the United States. So I don't think you can understand either the anger of the African-American community today, if you don't understand the history of the race wars in the US and also the militarization that has been always there, but the role of force in this race wars and the fact that the latest militarization of police is really the defeat of segregation in the 60s due to movements and then beating that back successively over the decades through one, one side militarization, other side incarceration, that the third onslaught of the American state has been the first was slavery, second was segregation and lynching, and the third has been incarceration, that you have 2.2 million people in jail, the highest population in the United States of proportionate to any other country in terms of the number of people jailed. And this is something which is now what you see, that the, la the largest section in jail, particularly when you look at the population of the country, the proportion of the people in jail, African Americans are by far the largest component in that. Proportionate to their population, their jail numbers are much higher. They, and there are enough records now to show that they're jailed for offenses for which others are not jailed. A white person would not be jailed. They're prosecuted when they would not be prosecuted. They're stopped on the road far more than a similar uh, the stopping of the roads doesn't happen for the white population. And finally, the prison sentences are longer and they are directed at 
various, in various ways that even small crimes can put you behind bars on the three strike law that you can be behind bars for a lifetime. So all of these have really are a part of the structural racism in the, in the United States, which is what has caused this explosion that you now see on the roads. This has been the biggest upheaval in, in the United States, in the cities, in the, in the US after the civil rights movement. And this is, has been even more than what we saw after uh, the Los Angeles uh, uh, protest that took place after the Los Angeles uh, violence against Rodney King, uh, where the policemen had beaten him up in, on camera. And finally, they were also let go. The, right. uh, they, were, they were not convicted in the court cases. Of course, that's the other part of it, that even Absolutely. if violence is caught on camera, even if they're witnesses, finally the police never get convicted. Right. And it's interesting because I think reports have also shown that the officer, Derek Chauvin, had a number of complaints against him. One of the accompanying officers who was also uh, involved in the killing also had complaints against him, but the state and uh, local authorities did not move against uh, either in terms of dismissing them or prosecuting them. So that's another very key aspect that police officers are almost rarely prosecuted. Yes, the issue that has come up also is that there's also the police unions, which have been very active. The police officer union in Minneapolis was in fact an uh, avid supporter of Trump. And in fact, he's the one who argued, now we can actually fight the criminals. Earlier, we were, we were the ones who were in handcuffs. So this is, of course, the consequence. But it's a combination of the uh, law as it exists that really protects the policemen, the way the court interprets them, the way the prosecution handles these cases, all of this is, is a consequence. The consequence of all of this is that ultimately the police officers get off virtually scot-free. Right. Even the basic pro uh, instruments which are there, supposedly, supposedly to, to uh, discipline them, doesn't really work. And a lot of it is also the false protection they get, that these are, there is a, a personal... Uh, protection of the information under freedom of information. You can't get access to certain information if it is a police officers. So we don't really know what happens to the com complaints and why they have not been acted upon. So full details are not available in this, in this kind of cases. This has been something that the, that the various authorities, various people have been arguing on that, you know, this is the way police are being protected. Now, the point that comes up is that in the United States, as we know, there have been a number of this kind of cases, a number of more steps supposedly have been taken. Ferguson, you saw a huge upsurge, which caused a lot of soul searching. And a lot of the issues that we are talking about did come up in Ferguson. And one of the issues that came up, a lot of the police revenue comes from stopping people and penalizing them. This is basically ticketing them. And therefore, it's a source of revenue. Now, if we look at the amount of, when you talk about budget, if you talk about the amount of equipment that the US police has got as a result of the, what's called the 1033 uh, defense uh, budget, which give out the act which allows them to give surplus material to the police, or you talk of the Homeland Security, They've got, I think, something like 50 billion worth of equipment put together, both these put together. I think the defense equipment is only 5 billion out of that. The Homeland Security is a much bigger amount. So if you put all of it together, it's actually equal to the defense budget of many countries in the world, probably more than most countries in the world. So that is the amount of equipment the police have got. Right. Now, these are structural issues. And of course, if you look at the courts and you look at the whole structure of law enforcement. Now, you see, you do not really, as a prosecutor, want to alienate the police because that's what you need for your uh, prosecutor to, uh, uh, career. So therefore, there is also that part of it that this does not lead to convictions. So the movement that in the US now seems to be coming up is because the police is at the end of it funded by the, uh, basically by the city the towns and so on. 
So just defund them. Exactly. Let's cut away their budget, take away their money. Yeah. Now, how much of that will work or not work, we don't know. But it is interesting that that, that move has come out. Now, it's also interesting, you know, the, uh, the recently the Trump talked about using the military for, the, for uh, basically this kind of disturbances, civil uh, struggles, protests, which are going on. And he, of course, the metaphor that he used was dominate the space. And also, which was uh, Esper, the defense secretary also says, the battle space. Right. So this militarization of now, right now is not just invisible in terms of the gear that they're using, but also the vocabulary that is being used need to dominate over them. Now, all of this works out to finally that what do the protesters do? After all, there has been the civil rights movement, won back some rights, Ferguson, there has been earlier Los Angeles. So all of this has led to an understanding of the problem. But the problem doesn't seem to go away. It comes back again and again. And you can see there have been recently Ahmed Arbery, the case where he was shot down by again vigilantes. And earlier we had a number of such cases. We had the shooting of a woman in her apartment by the police without apparent any cause. So you have a whole number of such cases. But at the same time, all the movements, all the protests we have seen, the Travon Martin case, all of them do not at the end of it seem to lead to results. So what do the movements do in the US? This is the question that is being raised again and again. And one of the, as I said, one of the arguments seems to be just take away their money. That might, if they're going to be defunded in some way or the other, if it succeeds, then of course the police will have to be have to think, well, it's our job as well. It's not just that, you know, we can do what we want and get away with it. There are consequences. And uh, whether this will succeed or not, we really don't know. But it is also interesting to watch. This is the same United States, which was calling itself the land of the free, asking people, the wretched of the earth, to come to the United States in the so-called free land. And we discover it has been free for some people, but it has not been free for all. But if we look at what has, what has happened, it is clear that the United States always has a completely different structure for its two sections. And what we are seeing is not a breakdown of police uh, and so on. What we are seeing is really a breakdown of the state, which is underlying state, which is racist. And the racist nature of the state is visible in the police violence we are seeing, and also the move against protesters. And earlier you had what is called dog whistle politics, that you made different things uh, indicate that you were talking about race, but you didn't really uh, directly talk about it. Now you have a Trump, so he directly talks about dogs being let loose on protesters. You have basically shooting starts, when the looting starts, all of this, again, hark back to 60s. So you have really not even the cover that the American political leadership used in order to couch its racial character. But now you have opened what somebody said. It's not dog whistle politics anymore. anymore. It's bullhorn politics. That's what you are seeing. And that's what Trump really represents, the ugly face of racist America. And that's where we are at the moment. So it does, does bring up very, very disturbing questions about the way the United States is going and what the protests there can do. But this has been huge protests that we have seen. I don't think it's going to uh, die down that easily. And even if it's the overt protest die down, you are going to see political action, different groups coming together. So I think this is going to have a long-term effect on at least a large section of the American population thinking of what to do, that what the current structure of politics is not enough, the two parties are not enough, that if there has something has to happen, then we really need a left alternative which will raise questions of racism and capitalism far more seriously. And I hope that that is what this particular set of 
pictures that we have in front of us. And as I said, if you are seeing it from India, you're really wondering, I mean, why are the police dressed in that kind of gear? And that must be questions which all over the world people must be asking. I mean, are they really facing an insurrection that they should be dressed like that? Is that the kind of uh, military that should be there? In fact, Trump repeatedly is calling for a military. And that's only can be justified under what's called the Insurrection Act. So are they really facing a situation of insurrection because people have come out in the streets? I mean, this really, this really brings out fundamental contradictions within the U.S. society and its protestations it has been making and what the reality is. Thank you so much for being for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.